Good afternoon, good evening to everybody and welcome. This event is organized by the Comparative and International Education Society or the CIES. My name is Iveta Silova and I currently serve as a CIES president. So most of you know that our society is one of the oldest and largest of approximately 50 comparative and international education societies globally. It brings together more than 3000 individual members, researchers, analysts, practitioners, students who represent universities, research institutes, government departments, non-governmental agencies, multilateral agencies uh, in multiple countries. CIS was established uh, as an academic association in 1956 and has attracted a diverse audience working towards its mission to foster cross-cultural understanding and scholarship. And almost half of our members right now come from countries outside of the United States, which is very exciting. So you all are very acutely aware is that COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted our lives and the operations of our society in major ways. So for two years in a row now, we have to cancel our face-to-face -face annual meetings and rethink how we operate as a society. But despite all of the challenges, uh, I think this pandemic also actually offered us a unique opportunity to rethink how we engage with each other and with all of our members in more sustainable and equitable ways. So for example, you know, the I think we now can much more seriously think about how we can stay connected and engage with colleagues who choose not to travel to the United States for political reasons, because of visa restrictions, because of the lack of funding, or because they choose, uh, you know, choose to travel less or not at all for environmental reasons. So I hope that we as a society can begin exploring new ways of engaging with each other in this context. But today um, actually is also one of such opportunities. CIS awards, um, ceremony and the awards actually are usually announced at our annual face-to-face -face conferences but we have missed the opportunity to celebrate our award recipients last year because of this impromptu transition into the virtual space in the middle of the pandemic so award ceremony was unfortunately one of the events that fell through the cracks during that time and to compensate for it and uh, to improvise and to improve um, in this context, we decided to move the celebration online, extending the opportunity for more CIS members to engage with the award recipients, but even maybe more importantly, expanding the time uh, of this wonderful intellectual engagement. So instead of a couple of minutes at a large event ceremony today, we have uh, you know, more than an hour with our award recipients and that's really exciting. But back to our event, today we will celebrate the recipients of two awards, Rachel Silver, who is the recipient of the 2020 Gail Kelly Award for her outstanding doctoral dissertation, and Heather Switzer, who is a recipient of the 2020 Jackie Kirk Award. We are celebrating these awards together because of this incred incredible synergy between the two award recipients and their work. And uh, but I will let Joan and my other colleagues to talk about it in more depth. But very quickly about the awards. The Gail Kelly Award was uh, created to honor the distinguished comparative educator Gail P. Kelly and her many contributions to CIS. It honors a doctoral dissertations that addresses social justice and equity issues in an international context. This award is confirmed um, on an outstanding dissertations that manifests academic excellence, originality, methodological, theoretical, and empirical rigor, and that addresses issues of social justice and equity in international settings, which may, uh, these issues of uh, equity and justice may include, but not limited to gender, race, class, ethnicity, or nationality. And the Jackie Kirk Award honors the professional life and deep dedication of Jackie Kirk to our field and to CIS in the areas of gender and education or um, education in conflict contexts, fragile states, post-conflict and peace education. Jackie Kirk was also committed to work on identity, particularly on girls and teachers, globalization as context for local practice and visual participatory research methodologies. But, um, you know, so furthermore, Jackie Kirk was professionally committed to encouraging dynamic and equitable collaboration between academics and practitioners. 
the, glo the global south and the global north and uh, the comparative and international educators and teachers on the ground. So um, I would like to thank Joan D. Jagger for all of her work as a chair of the 2020 CIS Awards Committee, as well as the committee members and the sub-award chairs uh, for their commitment and de dedication to this work. Uh, Francesca Salvi chaired uh, the um, Jackie Kirk sub-award committee and Lynn Payne served as a chair of the Gail Kelly sub-award committee. And I'm especially grateful to John um, for joining us today to moderate the discussion. And um, first things first, I would like to invite John to introduce our CIS 2020 Gail Kelly and Jackie Kirk award recipients. Thanks, Yvetta, for that and for the wonderful introduction to CIS and to these awards, which are such a, a great uh, honor to be able to um, present to these two recipients today. And I miss the fact that we're not on a big stage and that I get a chance to meet both of the awardees personally. This is my second year serving as the awards committee chair. And so I'm just excited to be able to talk about these two awardees because of their related work. Um, I want to say a few words about each of their work and how they're connected both around the topic of girls education, as well as in terms of the methodology of using ethnography, though they use it differently, and in addressing some of the tropes and assumptions about girls education that they aim to disrupt. Then each of the awardees will speak for about 10 minutes about their study, their particular book and dissertation. And then we'll have them actually exchange a set of questions between them that they have of each other. And then we'll open it up to um, your questions, my questions, if there's time. Um, it's an honor for me to actually introduce these because I work and teach in the field of gender education development. Um, Heather's book I picked up as soon as it was nominated to see if it would work in one of my courses. And Rachel's, I just enjoyed reading her dissertation. So um, first, I want to introduce um, the Jackie Kirk Award, and which is being awarded, as Yvette said, to Dr. Heather Switzer and her book, When the Light is Fire, Maasai School Girls in Contemporary Kenya, published by the University of Illinois Press. The committee, um, as, as Yvette said, was chaired by Francesca Salvi and several other uh, committee members. Um, and they noted that this, this book was um, that they thoroughly enjoyed this book and the narrative that she, uh, Dr. Spitzer crafted, especially around the lives, the voices and experiences of young Maasai girls and how you made visible um, the in and intelligible through th their lives through in your analysis. It really captures the spirit of the word, I think, beautifully. Dr. Schwitzer's book is an ethnographic study, as I said, with interviews with Maasai school girls in Kenya and like Dr. Silver, she engages with girls' stories in relation to assumptions about girls' education in the development of regime. She crafts an argument around the logics of the girl effects, or what are assumed sort of ripple positive social and economic outcomes from investing in adolescent girls. She also shows the dynamic changes occurring within communities in relation to schooling and development situating these changes in the specific Maasai community over time and in relation to colonialism, gendered norms, the nation state, and very specifically education and schooling. What I uh, most appreciated, many things, but of them, one of them was that Dr. Schwitzer makes this important, I think, distinction, but also connection between the term school girlhood and girlhood where she suggests that girls actually mutually co constitute both of these social categories, rather than seeing them as binary subject positions that are often assumed by the international development regime, where the school girl receives these sort of social and economic benefits, delaying marriage, not getting pregnant, other things, right? But the non-school girl does not. She shows, however, that schooling doesn't simply disrupt patriarchy and girls are not simply recreating new agentic selves. Through her analysis, she engages with the logics around schooling related to inoculating girls from pregnancy, early marriage, circumcision, and others, other things, and shows us 
much more complicated ways that girls engage with embody these norms. And that connects nicely, I think, with Dr. Silver's work um, on pregnant school girls in Malawi. So Dr. S Rachel Silver, um, who was awarded the Gail Kelly Award for Outstanding Dissertation. And this um, award was chaired by Dr. Lynn Payne, who was with us today. So I'm glad to have her here. Um, this, uh, Dr. S Silver was actually nominated by Professor Nandy Nancy Kenda, one of her advisors at the University of Wisconsin. The committee stated about this uh, uh, dissertation that the focus, the originality, the theoretical richness, and methodological strengths make it a remarkable study. The dissertation exemplifies the purpose of the award with its nuanced attention to very pertinent social justice issues related to the to these young girls' daily lives, as well as those that are as they are affected by the international development industry. Let me say a few words about the theoretical and methodological richness. Like Dr. Dr. Spritzer, Dr. Silver explores discourses associated with pregnant school girls through a multi-sided ethnography, focusing on what she calls middle figures through the use of meeting ethnography. She shows how education policies, in this case, the Malawi readmission policy, and the lives of pregnant school girls become a social and development problem, in effect, a moral problem that needs to be addressed. To examine these problems, she uses this concept of moral triage, which I hope she'll say more about, which is in some way the evaluation of girls' lives as well as policies and aid in moral terms. Like Dr. Schwitzer's work that moves beyond the binary of the school girl and the non-school girl, Dr. Silver's work also shows that discourses about and their lived experiences of being a student are not separate from motherhood. But in order to go to school, girls need to assume a certain social position of what she calls secondary virgins. In this way, she uses the idea of a boundary subject to show how girls are imagined to be different archetypes for different policy purposes. I hope she'll say more about some of these concepts in her analytical um, approach as she shares about her work with us. So let's start with Dr. Silver. Thank you for joining us, Rachel. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Yay to Zoom logistics that we're all getting so used to. Um, okay, so I will get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, um, Iveta and Joan, for the very generous introduction. Um, it's wonderful to be here virtually, and thanks to everyone for volunteering to spend more time on Zoom and for taking time um, today to attend. So I was deeply uh, honored to receive the 2020 Gail Kelly Dissertation Award and to have my work seen as in line with Gail Kelly's commitment to equity in education. So thank you. Um, and I'm also deeply appreciative of the care and energy that went into the dissertation beyond me um, from my outstanding advisors, Nancy Kendall and Claire Wenlin to the dissertation committee at UW-Madison and most significantly to the folks in Malawi who so generously allowed me to learn from them in this project. Whoops, all right. Get this going. Okay, um, so as noted, my name is Rachel Silver. I'm an assistant professor at York University in Toronto, um, where I also co-direct the Borderless Higher Education for Refugees project in Dadaab, Kenya, which I'd be more than happy to speak about later if time allows. Um, broadly speaking, my research is located at the intersections of the fields I've put on the slide, comparative and international education, African studies, and the anthropologies of development, policy, and gender. Um, as noted, I use ethnographic methods to um, explore how discourses, programs, and policies related to gender and education intersect with young people's lives. And I'm particularly interested in sexuality as a contested terrain um, on which larger struggles over moral and political authority are waged. Um, so my dissertation, Sex, Schooling, and Moral Triage in Malawi, is, as mentioned, a multi-sided ethnography of schoolgirl pregnancy. So what I do is tell the story of one girl's education initiative, Malawi's 1993 readmission policy, which banned the permanent expulsion of pregnant girls from school, and which was officially reformed during uh, 2016, um, during the course of my research. So I draw on the conceptual and methodological tools of the anthropology of policy, which I can talk about later or not, um, to ask the following questions. Uh, how has schoolgirl pregnancy come to be so widely constituted as a social and development problem um, in Malawi, but also worldwide? 
um, how do international and national development policies, relationships, and practices shape student mother experiences? And what can this reveal about the limits of current international development approaches? So um, this is a snapshot and it's by no means exhaustive, um, but I, I want, before I dive into my project in more detail, to situate myself and the study of student pregnancy in relation to the, to the very rich scholarship on girls' education that comes from the CIS community, including um, from many folks who are here today. Um, as well as from critical feminist scholarship on adolescent pregnancy, which um, I'm not speaking to as much. Again, um, the list is by no means exhaustive, but I draw on work that looks critically at girls' education and women's empowerment as development projects, that examines possibilities and limitations of girls' education, discourse, policy, and practice, um, that highlights girls' and female teachers' aspirations, agency, and experiences in school, and that theorizes girl effects logic and development. And these projects are are certainly overlapping um, theoretically and empirically. Um, so in the broadest of terms, this literature and my work, um, you know, takes on one of the primary solutions, takes on a strong, considers one of the primary solutions put forward um, by international development experts over the past 30 years to mitigate global poverty and improve well-being, and that's girls' education. So here, as noted, the logic goes that if you educate a girl, you educate a nation and um, change the world. And by sending girls to school and delaying her sexual debut and childbearing, you can triple, trigger excuse me, the ripple effect of positive health, economic, and demographic outcomes. Um, in this scheme, however, adolescent pregnancy signals the programmatic failure of schooling to fulfill its promise. And pregnant schoolgirls themselves embody aborted potential. Their presence in school signifies the transgression of adult child boundaries. And this is um, an image from a life skills textbook in Malawi. So in 1993, Malawi became the first country in the region to give girls who became pregnant as students a second chance at schooling. Um, and though it was deeply controversial at the time, readmission policy emerged during an era of sweeping change as the country um, adopted what Nancy Kendall calls a global policy package of political democratization, economic liberalization, and free primary education. Um, and readmission policy, this is the original text. I couldn't find a digital copy. This was the paper that I actually found in the ministry. Um, reflected the hard work of a coalition of grassroots activists, a feminist minister of education, international funders, and importantly, receptive community leaders. And legalizing school return for young mothers offered a means through which to enact the newly enshrined right to school. Yet in the past several decades, readmission policy has largely failed to get girls back to school. And that's not to diminish its you know, symbolic significance and significance in the lives of, of individual girls. Um, as a result, and in response to mounting pressure from um, feminists and other activists in the girls' education community, um, Malawi's Ministry of Education called for a formal review of the policy in 2016 to make it more effective and widely disseminated. Um, this is just a photo of the ministry building and the name has since, since changed and dropped the science and technology. Um, so over the course of a year of fieldwork, I had the unique opportunity to conduct um, participant observation and closed door readmission policy review meetings that included government officials, international funders and NGO representatives. And I relied heavily on what Jen Sandler and Renita Thedval have written about and termed meeting ethnography to get at the inner workings of the policy reform process. And by, by observing the readmission policy process, I could explore how mid-level stakeholders um, from different institutional locations engaged with prevailing archetypes of young girls and how these engagements then reflected and remade discourse on school pregnancy, design of projects targeting girls, the everyday school and community level regulation of girls' bodies and sexuality and the lived experiences of student mothers. Um, so just a brief note about methods. In order to make sense of the conversations that were happening in the readmission policy review process, I paired this meeting ethnography with participant observation in other key spaces um, relevant to student pregnancy that included student homes and schools, as well as NGO offices and sex education trainings. I also did um, over 125 semi-structured interviews with a range of actors, um, including young mothers, parents, teachers, NGO activists, et cetera. Um, and so just to give a sense, you know, I tried to center the policy and in, in figuring out where to spend my actual time, I tried to center the policy and then move around geographic spaces, which was always a bit of a zero sum game. Um, but I largely, I spent quite a bit of time with one girls education NGO and quite a bit of time in one secondary school, one peri urban secondary school, and then toggled trips to the capital to attend meetings as they came up. Um, 
So over the course of my work, I quickly became interested in the moral and material stakes of readmission policy, not only for the people whose lives it was intended to shape, such as young women and their families, but also for the stakeholders tasked with reviewing and implementing it. Um, in other words, I began to interrogate sense making about schoolgirl sexuality together with power relations and international development. Um, so I want to step back a minute and just talk about why readmission policy. Um, I argue in my dissertation that readmission policy review process demonstrated what Didier Fessin identifies as the proximity between the moral and the political in the public sphere. So Fessin argues that policies have a moral heart, that they're written by people with particular sensibilities. Um, policies about girls' sexuality then um, represent focal points of broader debates over what it means to be a moral Malawian and who can and should weigh in on this conversation. And it's that latter question about who can and should weigh in on this conversation that became an important line of inquiry for me. Um, and just to contextualize sort of why Malawi, um, I, I believe that Malawi is a particularly fruitful space in which to think about these questions of gender and power and development, given the high percentage of the national budget derived from overseas development assistance. And I put, um, I put um, statistics from the year of my research there. Um, it's worth noting that international funders provide approximately 40% of Malawi's national budget uh, the year that I, was, that I was there. And the review process itself, for instance, was fully subsidized by an international funder, even as it was officially led um, by, by governmental actors. And um, at the same time, there's really heavy emphasis on programming for girls in Malawi. It's, um, the girls' education industry is a very crowded space. And the year I was there, there are 55 different NGOs worked to implement 571 different girls' education initiatives um, across the country, which is a remarkable commitment anywhere, um, and particularly in a country with 19.2 million. And I've put a couple examples of just sort of the scale of some of these larger, um, more uh, transnationally famous initiatives. Um, Okay, so, and again, this is just a, a map of some of the actors present on the scene, certainly not all. So I lack time to kind of go into detail of all of my arguments today, of course, but I do wanna share a little bit um, about my, the main arguments that I make across space. Um, and that's that diverse stakeholders evaluated pregnant schoolgirls, the state of Malawi and international development as a project in moral terms. And in a process I decided to call moral triage, these evaluations informed the distribution of scarce resources. So moral triage is a process by which actors in development apply moral assessments about virtue and deservedness to decide where to channel material assistance in a context um, where there is significant need and limited resources. And as a theoretical tool, Moral triage provides a unique lens through which to understand the relationships among NGOs, international funders, and state actors, um, and reveals a very different valence than is common in international development discourse. And again, I don't have time to go into detail, but I just wanna show you briefly kind of what moral triage looks like across space and the different sections of my dissertation elaborate on these different you know, spaces. Um, First, funders chose to direct millions of dollars to international NGOs rather than to the Malawian government or to Malawian NGOs, um, often based on what people talked about as the innate corruption or inefficacy of Malawians. Um, INGOs chose and Malawian NGOs to subcontract to using similar criteria, along with you know, local NGOs' ability to deal with um, particular policies and practices that might have been, that were understood as unfavorable to local NGOs. Um, teachers rank students based on official markers of vulnerability, um, but then chose which girls received and kept bursaries or scholarships based on the performance of sexual abstinence and goodness in school. Um, and finally, within families, parents of student mothers managed overwhelming need and resource constraint within the household by taking over care of grandchildren, often leaving young mothers, you know, the students themselves, um, to fend for themselves a bit. So it, in each of these cases, moral triage was what people did as they deployed their moral sensibilities with, within a particular political and moral economy. And as, as mentioned, by tying deservedness to virtue um, and often sexual virtue, those with resources could moralize what was inevitably a process of improving possibilities for some, but not for others. And this allowed for the emphasis of the agency of individual girls or individual institutions rather than inequitable systems and structures. 
So <laughs> where to go from here? I guess I moved slides a bit quickly. Um, I've published or submitted for review sections of the dissertation in various venues, including an African studies review, feminist studies, gender and ed. Um, and I have several other publications, articles in the works. Um, and I plan on connecting this work in Malawi to field work I've done in Dadaab in the Dadaab refugee camps in Kenya to explore the concept of moral triads ac across space um, in a book length manuscript. And finally, um, what I'm working on now is a new project with colleague Alyssa Morley at MSU at Michigan State that looks at constructions of risk in girls' education during COVID-19. And I'm happy to talk more about the specifics of this um, in the Q&A. And for now, I'm thrilled to pass it over to Heather, whose book I loved and whose work has been so influential on my own. Thank you. Thanks. Oops, I forgot the thank you slide, which is my daughter who was with me uh, during field work. This was field note taking. Right. Just a quick reminder, if you wish to submit questions about Rachel's presentation, you can do so to me in the chat directly or to everyone. Thank you, Heather, for joining us and go ahead and talk about your book. Okay, let me also see if I can screen share. I'm not sure I'm as fluent in this as Rachel. Can you guys see that? Okay. Okay, so um, hi, welcome to everybody. It's nice to see some familiar faces and some new ones. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here and very delighted to receive the Jackie Kirk um, Book Prize. Thank you, Iveta and Joan, um, for that wonderful introduction. Um, before anything, I want to thank all of the Maasai school girls who have generously given me their time, their care, their energy, and, and most of all, their stories. I opened the book with a series of questions Maasai school girls would often ask me. Among them, have you come to Kenya just to ask my Maasai girls questions? I'm eternally indebted to those girls who have patiently answered all of my questions over the years, even when they seemed like silly or dumb questions to them. Um, and I hope to continue to learn from them. Um, I also want to thank the adults in their lives. Uh, their parents, their teachers, their NGO allies and advocates who are also my friends, my colleagues and my mentors without whom really nothing would be possible, um, much less this book. And lastly, I would like to thank the, the CIS Book Award Committee for selecting my book, my book, to the committee and the donors who make the Jackie Kirk Book Award possible. And last but never least, I would like to honor Jackie Kirk for her commitment to girls worldwide. It is, after all, through Jackie's work that I learned that girls studies was even a thing that existed. Um, which I now consider to be one of my intellectual homes. I'm so excited to be, and I just want to add, I'm so excited to be in discussion with Rachel and her fascinating work. And I probably won't have time to talk about my next project very much, but it is focused on uh, schoolgirl motherhood. And um, this dissertation is going to become my best friend. Um, okay, so let me see. That's not. So a premise of my work is that girlhood is a transnational cultural construction produced and perpetuated through globally circulating meanings, norms, practices, and embodiments. And because of this, girlhood is always embedded in systems of power and is thus a political category. In all of these ways, girlhood is inherently dynamic and varied. Nonetheless, very powerful single stories, some of which we saw beautifully illustrated in uh, Rachel's PowerPoint, um, circulate about girls' empowerment, and they continue to dominate the global, global conversations about girlhoods. By now, you are familiar with this discourse. One of the central goals of my book is to explicate and critique this global discourse. I use the phrase global uh, girl effects logics to foreground a global assemblage of discursive strategies in which poor racialized black and brown girls in the global south are exceptionalized as single source multipliers of global poverty reduction, wealth creation and labor extraction. That doesn't always forward. 
<clears throat> in this discourse, what Chandra Mahanti has called third world difference and Catherine Moeller calls third world potential, girls' bodies and minds are converted into capital and targeted as sites of intervention and investment. Within this logic, it's easier for the global public to think of girls' bodies in simple economic terms as labor loss to pregnancy, dropout, and joblessness, or to labor gained through school completion, delayed fertility, and formal employment. Indeed, the exceptional adolescent girl is most often constructed as a schoolgirl who, once she is saved by schooling, will be able to, quote unquote, call the shots. Which brings me to the second and related goal for my book, which is to consider and really try to understand what it's like to live as a target of development. To ask what does it mean and what is it like to be an adolescent schoolgirl within these conditions? My focus has been on Maasai schoolgirls in a rural and relatively remote array of small communities in Southern Kenya in which girlhood itself is complicated by the schooling imperative for all children and with specific emphasis on educating girls. The question, who is a girl, is by no means straightforward in this context. I interviewed and spent time with over 135 Maasai schoolgirls, most, most of whom had never traveled beyond their village, much less outside of Kenya. Yet their, ex yet their questions, concerns, narratives, and insights give evidence of an acute knowledge about their own experience, as well as their desires that both conform to and exceed global normative expectations. In the book, as Joan mentioned, I theorize schoolgirlhood as a relatively new gendered cultural space formed through the process of going to school that extends childhood and codifies adolescence for girls who are in school, entails the necessary performance of gender, generation, and culture, requires daily negotiations and navigations, is a product as well as a producer of transnational subjectivities. And like the general category of girlhood itself, and counter to representations of school girlhood as a demographic accomplishment, that is enrolling in a girl who enrolls in and persists in school. I see girlhood as a contingent enactment and embodiment. As the chapter titles in my book suggest, and I'm not gonna go into these in great detail um, out of the interest of time, but I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I see school girlhood as situated within specific historical and political contexts. Uh, so it's situated in this lar larger global discourse. Uh, in the second chapter, I try to look um, at the, the, this idea that Maasai quote unquote hate education and always have um, and put and sit that beside the discourse, which I heard over and over again, that Maasai are quote unquote hungry for education. Uh, in the third chapter, I talk about the ways in which girls themselves and their mothers in particular produce um, and perform the idea of school girlhood. Uh, in the fourth chapter, I use this um, sort of amazing uh, uh, um, remedy that my um, research assistant offered to one of the girls we interviewed that the best way for her to um, convince her dad to let her stay in school would be to make good grades. And so this notion that the medicine for fire is fire um, it came forward to me as sort of a, a really poignant paradox for how school girlhood is negotiated. Uh, lastly, or not quite lastly, in chapter five, I look specifically at um, uh, this sort of uh, uh, girl child school girl dichotomy um, through through the lens of Nkanyakwe. Actually, that's part of chapter four and chapter five. Um, Nkanyakwe is a local um, social category that sort of complicates um, the binary of a uh, girl who is in school and girl who is not. And then lastly, in the last chapter, I talk about 
this idea of people who use uh, both hands. For Maasai schoolgirls, counter to the single story that educated girls naturally leave behind culture and community, the schoolgirls in my research want, do not want to cease to be Maasai. They want to be better Maasai. Theorizing schoolgirlhood as a new kind of personhood has allowed me to tease apart the entanglements of vulnerability and agency in schoolgirls' lives and really try to understand the dynamics of both empowerment and disempowerment that characterize schoolgirlhood. I do this with the help of anthropologist Saba Mahmood's theorization of inhabited agency in which schoolgirls strategically manage limiting expectations and norms, all the while inhabiting them. I also draw on the late Sylvia Chant's work on the feminization of responsibility and obligation as a framework for mapping the particularly post-feminist, neoliberal, racial capitalist tenor of schoolgirlhood, in which local, ethnic, and gender norms and global gender and racial norms come together to shape both opportunities and constraints for Maasai, school girl, Maasai girls who go to school, and which empowerment through education as a means for interrupting intergenerational poverty by relying on gendered expectations for personal responsibility, obligation, and care for others sits well with Maasai gender expectations for girls and women's emotional and material labor. Ultimately, I argue schoolgirlhood is a product and is productive of girl effects logic and what I have come to call and discuss, um, at least provisionally in the, in, in the uh, conclusion, GID or girls in development, which I see as genealogically connected to WID or women in development, GAD or gender in development, which some of you will recognize as the prevailing frameworks for thinking about women, gender and development. In this discourse, the power of educated girls to labor away growing economic inequalities has been manufactured in part by the joint for forces of global economic crisis and economic austerity and emerged and circulated through development discourse and policy agendas developed through North-South tra transnational networks beginning in the 1980s. As girl power proliferated in public discourse at the turn of the 21st century, it also traveled south uh, through circuits of racial capitalism, multinational corporate capitalism, and partnerships between governments and the private sector. In the conclusion, I try to consider how the two strands of analysis in my book, a critical exp explication of girl effects logic in both local and global discourse, although I would, I would argue that uh, local folks don't necessarily talk about the girl effect in a very specific way, they also echo many of the same conceits. And an immersive analysis of schoolgirls, teachers, and mothers' narratives of schoolgirlhood really forces us to reckon with the power of development discourse and the circulation of promissory affects as they materialize in Maasai, school, in Maasai girls' lives every day. So I hope in this that I've been provocative rather than conclusive. Um, I hope I have positioned schoolgirls as knowledgeable subjects who have so much to teach us about education as development. And I will go ahead and stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Schwitzer. That was very, very uh, nice to hear about what a fabulous book. And I know others have here have read it. I am collecting some questions. So if you have questions, either send them to everyone or send them to me. But in the meantime, as you do that, um, I want to just ask Rachel and Heather to exchange a little bit of their own questions for each other just to start us off because I think they want to engage a little bit with each other. So go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm excited to jump in here as someone who has um, read your work over time. So my question to you, Heather, is, you know, you've written and published in the past on, you know, what you call girl effects logic. And this book um, centers 
this qualitative study of girls' lives. And I'm interested in how you came to put these two categories or pieces of analysis together. You know, the first being cultural narratives or transnational discourses around girls' education, and the second being the lived experiences and insights of girls themselves. Uh, sure, and there's there's really no way to answer that without 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 talking about the glaring missing piece, which is basically what you do. You know, the sort of middle the 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 middle layer, the meso layer of um, sort of ministerial officials, civil servants. Um, NGO um, uh, NGO actors and people who are working at that policy level. Um, honestly, when I started my, so my book started as a dissertation and when I started in graduate school, I thought I would be looking at what I, in my mind, thought of as the NGOification of, um, of development in contexts like Kenya where tiny little CBOs and NGOs emerge. And I had seen this through various interactions, um, both as a Peace Corps volunteer a long time ago <laughs> in, in Ethiopia, and then as sort of a volunteer in various NGOs in um, Maasai communities in, in Kenya, and how sort of mother's groups or micro enterprise would be developed as a way to raise money to put girls in school. So I thought I was going to be looking at that. Um, which is what is so intriguing about your work, um, among all of the other things that are intriguing about your work. But as I started, this was like the early 2000s. Um, and at that time, the girl effect wasn't on the stage, right? And as I was reading in the literatures around girls' education to sort of give myself some context for this other thing that I thought that I was doing, I, I, I just realized there was really at that time, certainly no book length um, examination of girls' perceptions of education and development. Like there was this presumption that girls must be educated and that girls want to be educated. But I just wondered like, is that, what do they think? And so it was really that simple conceit that shifted my uh, attention toward really wanting to focus on the girls themselves and some of the key adults in their lives. And I talk about this in the book. I, I end up not talking to Maasai fathers that much for a couple of different reasons. The basic ones being, first of all, I was told Maasai fathers can't tell you anything about girls. Um, and some of that is the presupposition around uh, 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 regarding a closeness among mothers and daughters. Some of that is sort of... Um, uh, still quite trenchant cultural taboos around Maasai men being in close proximity to their daughters after a certain age. But also it was the fact that um, when I started the field work in 2007, there was an incredible drought in the communities that I was spending time in and men were literally not present. They had taken the cows and they had moved. People were consolidating households and you know just tr trying women or doing what they could to keep girls in school. And so I, I ended up spending most of my time talking to um, mothers and teachers and some of the teachers and the NGO men that I talked to also happened to be Maasai fathers and so I got a little insight in that regard. Um, but at when I came home and I was trying to write this dissertation and eventually I did, it was toward the end of that process um, that I learned about the girl effect in 2008 and 2009 and I was sort of stunned by this vast gap that I saw between this discourse that was generating so much attention and that seemed so impoverished um, versus sort of the conversations and um, the observations that I had been making when I was in Kenya. So I, I was like, I've got to figure out how to bring these together. And I don't know that I did that as well as I had wanted to or might have hoped, but that was certainly the goal because while I wouldn't, argue that global discourses determine the experience of everyday people. I do think that there is a relationship between the sort of circulation of subjectivities and the way in which they get materialized in people's lives, either through institutions such as the school, the family, marriage, the economy, and, and, and things like that. So I'll stop there. Thank you. So I, I have a question for you. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Which is sort of related. I mean, I have kind of, I've kind of um, 
stack this deck, I think, a little bit, but I think we're both clearly interested in the relationship between discourse or cultural mm -hmm. narratives and lived experience. Um, and your your work is so fascinating um, about the way in which you focus on the, the insight that you give about how these things get materialized in institutions, specifically this I mean, I'm I'm interested in middle figures. I'm interested in the secondary virgin. Like I could go on and on. Um, but could you talk about um, sort of how you have have tried to get at this relationship between discourse and lived experience? Yeah, thank you. And and I completely agree that I think we're both fascinated in sort of how the big global discourses, um, you know, manifest and materialize in young people's lives. And, and when I went at it, you know, I, I had this one policy and there was, as you mentioned, this kind of missing understanding of what was happening kind of between this big discourse that was, um, you know, promulgated and spread around NGO, large NGOs and, and the conversations happening in communities and schools. And I had a few different opportunities to um, work with folks in Malawian NGOs who were um, really articulate about kind of how some of these contestations of power taking place in international development that so many folks at CIS, you know, in critical development studies write about. And I started to realize that this idea that looking at student pregnancy um, not only kind of gets at how discourse is materialized in young people's lives, but also provides a unique way to look at these issues of power um, and power dynamics. And so I started to um, read because that's a dissertation and that's what you do. Um, and there's you know, a really rich literature in African studies that looks at um, folks who kind of translated between colonial policies and you know, uh, practices on the ground. And the study, and middle figures isn't my term, Nancy Rose Hunt used it, um, looking at childbirth practices in the, in the Congo. And um, you know, by paying attention to this kind of middle category of folks who are um, navigating between largely rural communities and the colonial state allowed um, a much more nuanced um, view of colonialism, you know, less as encounter and more as contestation and acts of resistance. And I think similarly, you know, studies are, have cropped up in um, development studies as well, you know, the anthropology of development, critical development studies that are more and more interested in NGO workers and intermediaries. Um, and so I became interested in that as well and, and decided to, you know, sort of spend time with folks navigating both um, ex gendered expectations and um, just this really intense, you know, terrain of power with deeply unequal access to resources. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, yeah. Thanks, Rachel. And I, I have some questions coming in, and so I do want to get to some of them. And, and some of them actually relate to questions you have asked each other in our preparation for this about your future work. But before we get to future work, um, I wanted to pose a question that I had um, and thought I would ask later, but it came in as a question from someone else too, and sort of to, to, to kind of move this out of the realm right now of, of your immediate work, what you did, but to think about what does it mean for, um, for the current work and the current reforms being done. So the question is really, I'm curious if the speakers have thoughts about how to refresh or reform or shift the narratives of girls' education. So on the one hand, you've done a really good job of critiquing this. What does this mean to try to um, take the work that you've done and shift and reform the current narratives that you're critiquing out there. Is there is there a productive way to reframe these ideas, especially for people who, um, and maybe you consider yourself among them, but are, are very concerned with, it, on the one hand, still trying to address patriarchy and create better gender justice uh, where there are real oppressions. So, do either of you want to share around that question for those that, that was asked? I mean, I have a quick answer that I can give and then shift it to you, Heather. Does that sound okay? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the larger question of who frames the narrative is obviously one of power. And so I think the easiest knee-jerk answer coming out of my work would be um, that there are really nuanced conversations happening about um, gender and power 
among Malawian experts in the field of girls education. And so, um, you know, it working in INGOs, working in Malawian NGOs, and that if you trace the history of um, girls' education policies and practices in, Mala in Malawi, many of these same actors have been there for decades and were there, for instance, um, advocating for readmission policy. And so I would argue, and this is sort of a simple knee-jerk answer um, in some ways, but by paying attention to folks who have, you know, decades of experience um, doing this kind of middle work of implementing policy, of formulating policy, and of, of um, liaising with rural communities would be one um, way to nuance the discourse. And I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, I, um, I completely agree with that. I was, I mean, this is, this is a sort of half formed answer because I can't fully form it in part because I, I just reviewed a, um, a fascinating article um, for American History Review I think I know who wrote it, and I think she's <laughs> she's an Africanist historian. I think, um, but anyway, it's now in the revise and resubmit, so I can't like fully cite it. But she looks at the ways, the way in which um, Kenyan, in particular, um, NG, NGO uh, civil servants and academics around um, uh, leading up to Beijing and the formulation of section L of the Beijing platform for action, which is the first and still the only sort of, you know, um, multilateral like document that talks about um, girls education, girls uh, sort of empowerment broadly, including girls education and other things. And about how the, the original sort of language and activism in places like Kenya and Africa broadly was completely distorted and repackaged by various um, uh, multilateral actors and what landed in section L is really different, is much less nuanced, is much less political, is much less critical of um, sort of the relationship between development and global capitalism. It, it sort of severs any, any critique of colonialism or neocolonialism. So I think, I think Rachel's point is really important, who, who, who determines the narrative. Um, and then from, so, and, and I would echo the second part of her comment too, that what's really hard to convey in a bumper sticker or like a two minute, you know, promotional video is sort of this nuance. Um, I, I, you know, I, I to your point, jo jo Joan, I'm absolutely in support of gender justice, absolutely in support of girls' education anywhere, everywhere, particularly for poor girls. And so there, you've, it feels risky sometimes to, 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 to critique a discourse that on the one hand is also needed, like figuring out how to, how to, how to get this discourse right, I think is tremendously important. Um, and I just worry that, who, that those institutions which are in charge of it have a limited incentive, <laughs> you know, to sort of offer up those nuances. I, I think this is like Catherine Muller's work on the gender effect and her sort of deep institutional eth ethnography of, of the Nike Foundation and the girl effect is a really good example of just this that struggle. But I, sorry, I was just going to add, I think there are really vivid examples of, of the material implications of, of sort of filtering out the nuance. And for instance, in ways that um, do a disservice to girls and to the project of girls education. So for instance, um, you know, if an NGO has been implementing something and has figured out, you know, ways to support girls and hopes to continue this work, but the project funding runs out or the call for proposals shifts, um, then we know what, what works in girls' education, you know, in this space. And that's not going to be what's funded anymore. And it's back to the drawing table and back to the new call. And so I think that's sort of some of what's lost in in you know taking out the nuance of, of what's going on on the ground, what kind of interventions or what kinds of activities are meaningful, um, you know, just that it ends up getting kind of simplified and flattened again and again. Thanks for that, Rachel. And I think you, your, your attention to aid and where the money 
flows is also really important in that regard. And the nuance that both of you have in, in your projects is really important. But when we follow where money goes, to your point, we lose track of what we know and what we've learned over decades. Um, so things. There's a couple of questions. Um, that take us back to to more of your own work. Um, I, I, I have some also some questions for directed just at each of you as well. But this is for both of you. Someone asks, could you please speak more to your positionality or location and your stance in pursuing this research? What led you to study these respective contexts and how did you navigate the research related power dynamics that existed? And I think, you know, there's a potentially a number of junior scholars who are probably starting or in the process of doing this, as well as all of us who often have to navigate these questions. So your thoughts on this would be greatly appreciated. I'm happy to go first or second. Do you wanna either way? I'll go for it, that's good. I mean, I think the question of, of positionality is, is crucially important as we know. Um, that I won't, I won't speak for both of us, except to say that both of us, um, you know, came into our research sites um, privileged along many, you know, identity bases in relation to the spaces we were working. And I'll speak to mine that I was um, in a space during um, a hunger crisis, which made everything feel exacerbated. And, you know, I um, obviously came with significant privilege. I, I got into this work because I had the opportunity to do a research fellowship as a graduate student um, in Malawi with an organization and learned so much from this and became really interested in just the field of how aid works or, or the, the question of how aid works in a field of girls' education, which as I mentioned, um, was very populated, was, is, is, is huge, it's an industry. And so, um, you know, I, I don't think there's a good answer around positionality, except that it's something I continually grapple with. And it's important to think about kind of at all stages of the work and not just in the section of a piece of, of writing where you mention who you are and locate yourself. You know, it's something to continue reflecting on um, throughout. But, but I do think the questions of power and in international development um, and power in relation to girls schooling as a project are important questions to be asked from a range of positions. And, you know, I'll pause there and let Heather jump in. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. Um, there's, there's, there were so many, so many um, confusing and uh, challenging position, positionality issues in the research in in the 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 fieldwork part of the research that I conducted. I mean, being uh, adult, being an adult, um, and talking to children, uh, specifically girl children, um, in a cultural context in which you know. Def deference to adults and not making your not making your thoughts known is definitely in play. I'm not just an adult, but I'm also a white adult and an American in a context in which lots of Maasai girls and boys go to school at the pleasure of uh, uh, international donors, many of whom um, are um, in the United States, Canada, Europe, and other places. And so there was definitely this this happened more in the um, in some subsequent research that I've been doing around girl um, motherhood than it did in the original uh, research for this book, but just sort of the expectation that I was there asking questions and if the answers the answers were correct there was going to be. Um, there was going to be a sponsorship that was going to happen out of those conversations. And in part, I was um, just really fortunate to be um, working with a local Maasai NGO that sort of said out loud and positioned me in a way that they wanted me to be positioned, which is, this is not about sponsorship. This is about, con this is, you know, these are the, there's nothing attached to this other than the possibility that we could learn, um, learn things that would support the community. And so it, it, 
uh, questions around um, female uh, genital cutting, cutting and sort of an assumption that that was what I was there to talk about because that's what all um, foreigner, white foreigners want to talk about in Maasai communities, even though that wasn't, it came up all the time, but not for me. <laughs> and so there, there, were, there were lots of, um, I already mentioned the, the, the trouble that I had getting in conversation with fathers. Um, part of that was me being positioned as almost a girl. It took, it took a little bit of time for me to convince people <laughs> that I was as old as I was, uh, you know, it was helpful that I was married, but my husband wasn't there. So figuring out my um, status in sort of Maasai hierarchies was um, challenging uh, often. Um, but I just tried to take as many cues as I could from my um, local mentors and friends, and I screwed up um, more than once. But I show, uh, I talk about, I tell a little story in the introduction of the book where I was walking with um, a, uh, a girl, and we were just sort of walking down this dirt path, and she grabbed me and pulled me into the <laughs> into the bushes and I was like what are you doing and she was like don't you see all those men up there and if you looked up the, the road there was a group of about 20 older men in the shade and she said she was like if we go there we're gonna have to greet them which is an elaborate process in Maasai context and I would be implicated in this greeting process of you know giving our heads and so on and so forth and so she's like if we pass by this other way we won't have to we won't have to sort of waste our time doing this greeting and it was just a really interesting moment for me um or i was on the one hand grateful because we did have somewhere to be and it would have taken time we would not have been able to not do it but it was also it also felt really um um really emblematic of the way girls are constantly negotiating these power dynamics and that my body being there interrupted but also in some ways continued the power dynamics so anyway I'm, I'll stop <laughs> I don't know if they answered the question but thanks for that and I enjoyed reading that particular excerpt in the book when you spoke about it I think it's a really poignant example of girls navigating not only their own but their complicated relationship because you're with them um that's a really, really pointy one. So to a question that's a bit more specific, um, and this was again directed to both. Um, in both contexts, I'm wondering how you see or saw the role of teachers impacting girls' personal and school development. And then they asked some specific questions about, are they taught by female teachers? Are they single gendered schools? Um, how are the teachers recognized or treated in the communities? And in some way, um, this person says, I'm picking up that the parents are sometimes the teacher. So do you have comments to say a little bit more about teachers and their role in girls' lives and development? Rachel, you should go because I'm too talkative. <laughs> okay, um, I can, but I'm also happy to wait. Either way, um, the, the quick part is they were mixed gender schools with um, mostly male, but mixed gender teachers where I was working. Or, and um, it was a government school, not, not a boarding context. Um, and that teachers um, played an active role in gender socialization in school in ways that were codified in the official curriculum and in ways that moved beyond or often, or even, um, you know, contradicted is a strong word, but had their own gender socialization projects taking place that aligned with and, and moved alongside the official curriculum. And I think um, I'm actually gonna suggest, and not to, not to defer, but to point, point, your, point your question rather, um, Alyssa Morley, who's a colleague of mine and also a junior scholar who um, was in Malawi at the same time, went to look at, at the work of teachers and became really interested in um, how teachers were assumed or the roles teachers were assumed to play in these girls education projects, particularly female teachers and how those assumptions met with or didn't uh, teachers own experiences. And, um, you know, te female teachers are often positioned in girls education projects to serve as mentors or to serve as um, you know, mentors or assumed counselors. And in my own work, I saw repeatedly and write on this in a, in a piece I recently submitted um, that female teachers were often quite feared um, and that assumptions made in development projects around teachers as mentors, you know, didn't always sync with, with um, 
sort of how girls felt about teachers and teachers, female teachers included, um, often were quite uh, regulatory in relation to girls' sexuality. And so far from sort of being trusted, um, they were, you know, kept at a, girls kept at a distance from the teachers. And also um, teachers didn't necessarily come from the community of the school. Um, this was a peri-urban space. And so teachers came kind of from a more urban, the more urban center and came out to the schools. And so often were privileged economically in relation to the students, which isn't to say they were privileged economically because teachers often had to, um, you know, do multiple forms of income generation to make it. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't think the assumption that girls felt safe, you know, going to female teacher mentors to talk about their problems, whether they were related to gender practices or related to poverty, um, did not play out in my own work. Yeah, I second all of that. I would say um, uh, in, in the, the context um, of this, this book, all of the schools were um, mixed and they were all what um, they call in Kenya day schools. So they're, they're, none of them were boarding schools. And so um, the kids could walk to school um, and in the, in the morning and walk home in the evening. So these were kind of considered the sort of lowest kind of po possible school that one primary school that one could go to. The, 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 the more access you had, the better, um, the more likely you were to be at a primary boarding school. So these were, um, and some were very tiny. Uh, the largest probably had 500 kids. Um, and drew, you know, could, that was the stereotype of the, of the, the, you know, the kids walking six, seven kilometers in the morning and six, seven kilometers in the evening. Um, and uh, because it was so rural, the, 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 um, and relatively remote, um, the teachers tended to be primarily Maasai because it would be hard to get <laughs> folks who were not Maasai to stay. Um, in these contexts, but they were not exclusively Maasai. And a couple of the schools were what were in the in the in the case study were right at a peri um, urban sort of edge, and those teachers could come by Matatu every day and then go back to the town, and and that and so it, it it would be hard to generalize across the schools because you know some the teachers lived in you know their little one room house and they were there for months and. And months and months very you know far from their families and then others you know these couple of schools they could go home each day um you know to a house with electricity and television and, and and so on and so forth so it would be hard to generalize but i agree um with rachel that um teachers were in some ways regulatory um around gender concerns and 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 there it wouldn't necessarily be the case that women teachers would be particularly non-regulatory they might be but thanks I, think girls, I would just say that girls would often cite you know when I ask, would ask like they you know there's lots of questions around, around why is education important and and um and they would often say like my teachers my teacher has a different life than my mom has and I want to have a different life than my mom and that was really wrapped up with the ability to be educated and the ability theoretically to choose one's own husband. Thanks, Heather. And I think you both point to the interesting kind of contradiction that even Jack, I'm reminded of Jackie Kirk's chapter, for, I can't remember if it was a 2008 or what, but where she writes about sort of the contradictory role of teachers as well as both um, sort of providing possibilities for these girls to see these other options of being educated and at the same time regulating their behaviors. So really nice, nice connection to her our earlier work, Jackie's work. Um, so moving to just sort of uh, some final set of questions, there's a couple of them, but one is to thinking about your kind of connections to your future work. And um, a couple of people have asked uh, questions about that. And so for Rachel, could you tell us more about the comparative project you're doing and how you're looking at moral triage in those two spaces? And you also talked a bit about if, if this, you wanna say mention or related it to the construction of risk 
um, in girls' education in COVID-19, that work as well. Um, and then Heather, your next project is focused on school girl motherhood. So connecting again to Rachel's work um, in the role of, I guess, mothers and school girls. And so if you could speak to that as well. Heather, do you want to go first? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I, the, the Dadaab question is an interesting question. And um, I suppose I would start by saying that I had the opportunity to take part in um, girls education related studies in Dadaab prior to getting my PhD um, and prior to doing the work in Malawi. And so I haven't, due to COVID and other things, had the opportunity to sort of go back and pick up research work in Dadaab yet. Um, however, I was interested in whether some of the things I found around moral triage um, resonated in the Dadaab context and in my own experience, um, which included, I spent about six months in Dadaab. Um, I, I could think and imagine of moments in which a moral triage sort of framework would help me to make sense of particular things. And so that sort of remains a question. <laughs> That's what I hope to do moving forward. Um, but that project was interrupted, as was everything, um, by COVID-19 which has come to occupy my time, not only just in life and in, in the world we're all existing in, but also because um, I became interested in how um, risk was being constructed as a gendered phenomenon related to COVID-19. And, and those, of, those of us who, who are interested in girls' education will have noticed just a profusion of publications um, in a, a wide range of sources, you know, from the Washington Post to um, multilateral, bilateral, and NGO publications about um, girls education as a, or excuse me, COVID-19 as a particular risk to girls education. Um, and so Alyssa Morley, who I mentioned and I started collecting documents, we have about a thousand now, um, and are beginning to analyze sort of discursive trends um, in this work and are, are hoping to pair and are just starting to pair that work um, with a longitudinal cohort studies of girls as they navigate um, school closures and reopenings in Malawi and Kenya. So that's what I've been working on. And, and I can get more into you know, what we've started to see. I think um, some of it wouldn't surprise us. It's, it's a kind of an amplified version of girl effects logic that um, we've been talking about, but there are some new things. And yeah, I wanna hear about what Heather's up to. I wanna hear a new thing. Just I mean, <laughs> I don't think this would necessarily come as a surprise. Um, so it's not, I don't know if new is, is the right word, but there's an amplification of the way that concern around gender and COVID-19 is being racialized across space. So for instance, um, there are far, far fewer studies on the mental health of girls in the global South or of their access to extracurricular activities, for instance. And so again, this isn't necessarily new, but it's coming up in a really particular way with regard to COVID-19 discourse. And so um, there is a profusion of work in the US and in Canada around issues of mental health concern and, and isolation and um, you know, lack of access to sports or things like that. Whereas, you know, perhaps unsu unsurprisingly, you know, there is a there is a um, risks associated with girls in poor countries or across the global south are, are often sexualized. Um, to the exclusion of other sort of risk factors. So that's that's one thing. And then, you know, I think what we're really interested in is, is sort of what we've been talking about today um, the whole time, which is how um, how the construction of discourse relates to material reality. So how and if the way this problem is being framed will shape interventions that then play out in spaces like right. Malawi or Kenya and, and you know, sort of following the money a bit around what we talked about. But if a problem is named as such and an intervention comes in to target school girl pregnancy during COVID-19, for instance, what does that mean? What possibilities does that open up and what does it close for, for young people who are you know, navigating school closure, closures and reopenings in particular spaces? Now I wanna hear about your work. Thank you, that's, 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 that's really um, so interesting. And like I, like I said, it, uh, I can't remember when I said it, but I think I said it at some point, how, how I'm gonna be living with um, 
um, Rachel's dissertation and uh, her publications as I'm thinking about my next project, which has also been interrupted um, due to COVID. But in um, 2017, I did was able to spend some time in Kenya and I interviewed about 25 um, school girl, girl mothers. Um, and uh, um, because not surprisingly, as <laughs> Rachel's work makes really clear in my conversations around girls education broadly, um, there is just significant anxiety around school, school girl pregnancy. And it's important, I think, to say it that way because girl pregnancy is not as worrisome as school girl pregnancy. Um, in these contexts. If you're 15 and you're pregnant and you're not in school, you're a wife and a mother and life moves on. If you are 15 and pregnant and in school, it is a crisis. Crisis for the girl, crisis for a family, crisis for the community. And so again, thinking about, you know, how these different sort of categories of person get understood. And so I wanted to, I knew that eventually I wanted to sort of follow up and and think about what it about school girl motherhood and what that kind of looks like. And so Rachel's already done a lot of that in some really wonderful ways. But um, in the research that I was able to do in 2017, I, I learned a few things. Like, for example, I interviewed um, some girls who were actually back in school and their um, and their babies were with their moms. And this even, even even 10 years ago, this would have been sort of like unthinkable in these rural Maasai contexts that the girl wouldn't have been, quote unquote, married off immediately. Um, and so that some families are take or quote unquote, taking their girls back to school. I am curious now, though, because of your findings, Rachel, about how grandparents would or the, you know, the, 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 the parents of the girl, the grandparents to the child would invest in the child in certain ways, but then leave the girl to fend for herself. So in the um, in in the instances that I've had the chance to um, to the in the stories that I've had the chance to learn that hasn't been the case, but that isn't necessarily to say that it isn't the case. Um, it's, it's one of the, I would argue, it's one of the sort of interesting paradoxes of, of um, sort of Maasai culture is that it is insular or, or considered to be insular, but in part, it becomes a safety net. You don't, it's less likely for a Maasai girl to get lost in the urban masses. Um, in part because she's usually sucked back into her community through arranged marriage, um, which is seen as a way to protect her and her uh, future, um, even if it's not necessarily the, the marriage situation that she wants. Um, the other thing that I also encountered in that original, in those original 25 interviews is that I also um, interviewed a couple of husbands. And in some cases, the husbands were actually the boyfriend who was actually the age mate of the girl, which is also felt very surprising to me. Now, in a couple of cases, there was definitely the girl and the boy ran off together and there was threats of arranged marriage and there was, you know, to who wouldn't, the arrangement would not be to the boyfriend or the progenitor of the baby, but to a man chosen by the family. Um, and so there, there's all these sort of complexities um, around what happens in pregnancy and motherhood for girls in the context of schooling in this particular cultural context that I'm still trying to tease out. But in addition to const, in, in addition to discourse, I'm also trying to think through affect a little bit and what and how do girls understandings of themselves and how they feel about their sexual selves, how they feel about sex or attraction, how they feel about pregnancy, um, sort of animate certain kinds of social action. And I'm not entirely sure what that relationship is because I'm still trying to figure it out. And I was supposed to have been, um, I have a winter grin fellowship to be and to return to Kenya, but I wasn't able to go this past summer and it doesn't look like I'll be able to go this summer. So that's just getting sort of nudged along. 
Very intriguing areas of work, I think, this bringing together these issues around pregnancy, but also as you were just talking about the, uh, the areas of, of research on sexuality, how girls make sense of their sexuality um, and the affective components of that. So look forward to seeing more about that, Heather. Um, maybe in a concluding question, and we only have a few minutes left before we end this session, which has been very, very fascinating. And I see other people have written comments in as well about how they've appreciated the conversation. Um, I have asked each of you to maybe conclude with thinking about your thoughts for junior scholars, particular people who are probably going out to try to do this kind of work in the area of gender development education and thoughts that you have around key issues as well as methodologies um, to explore. And some of this may have already come out in some of your answers a little bit today, but if you want to give some, some suggestions uh, as where, to where we should be going with some of these questions um, in the field for all of us, actually. So do you want to start, Heather? Yes. I will start. Um, uh, where we should be going, I'm, I, I don't, I'm not, I, this, I will say this, this is slightly off from the hip and I don't want to be, um, I don't want this to be misread because it's, it's, it's complicated, but I do think that the questions of gender with respect to masculinity and sort of norms around um, uh, the sexual lives of young girls really cannot be divorced from <laughs> their relationships with boys and masculinity you know like femininity like gender norms are you know is also produced historically and contingent culturally um i'm thinking about um dorothy hodgson's work and which is relevant to mine with respect to maasai um maasai subjectivities and i, I don't I, this is not necessarily related to girls, but as a trope that came up over and has always come up in my research is the idea of the hated son. Um, and the hated son is the one who is now in the formal economy and the loved son is still in the pastoral economy and struggling, you know, with poverty in that context. And so um, I feel like there's in, in a Maasai context specifically, but probably more broadly, these questions about um, gendered power relationships and how they get um, framed vis-a-vis -vis the schooling imperative, I think is really important. I mean, even in 2007, I, um, when I was going around um, one of the, like the teachers inevitably would say, could you speak to the class the class eight, you know, kids, and they're, you know, the 10 kids who had made it to class eight, all, nine of whom were boys would be sitting there. And they would say almost every time, teacher, teacher, why do you care about girls more than boys? And sort of trying to something, something, I think we need something. This is not to reinsert sort of a focus on men or boys to the exclusion of girls, but to think about the way that gender functions in these in the schooling imperative, I think is important. Yeah, I would echo that. I, I would say that, you know, there's a significant pushback um, in communities, for instance, about how some of the programs are framed in a way that focuses so narrowly on girls as opposed to on gender relations. And I think some of this pushback isn't necessarily taken up um, by the aid infrastructure that's you know, promoting the girl effect. And I think there's something there that needs to be paid attention to. And the, the only other thing I would add is that I think when writing a dissertation or working you know, as, as a junior scholar, there's sometimes the idea or the fear that something has already been done and there's no space for something new to be done. And I think it's um, there's a really rich community of folks that study girls' education and gender and education and gender and development, you know, here at CIS and broadly, and that there's plenty of room for new spaces and perspectives and ideas and conversation. And um, that I would just say rather to approach it as rather than approach it as everything, you know, this has been done and this has been done, and just that there's you know plenty of room for new new ideas and angles and conversation and participants and that's what i would say and i absolutely second that i think it was um 
it's been a minute, but I got my, I came out of, I graduated in 2009. I'm fairly slow. Like some people have like three books, but anyway, I graduated in 2009, started my job in 2010. And I remember um, one of Catherine Muller's first articles came out and I was like, it's done. It's already been written. I have, there's nothing I can say. And then I, I thought, you know what, that's silly. Surely there's something I can say, but my, but we are incentivized to compete and to feel that the, the lane is very narrow and that there isn't space. And so um, to, to second Rachel's um, comment, I, th I think flipping that script is really important. And so what I decided to do is I, I sent Catherine a note and I was like, hi, you don't know me, but I'm writing in the same area. And here's something that I've written and I can't wait to cite your work. And then that started this conversation that was very positive mm -hmm. um, and productive rather than like, you know, oh my God, she scooped me or some weird thing that I init initially thought. Our work is different, but related and, and her work informs mine so powerfully. So I, I, I definitely think that that is the case um, that, that Rachel's right. <laughs> with that, but with both of your comments, I have a lot of confidence both in the field broadly around the work that will be done around gender education development and within CIS, having been a long member of the Gender and Ed Committee, knowing many people who are on this, um, this forum right now who are members of that and engaged in this work, um, both long and short term, um, and, I, and Yvette, you as well might speak to this, um, it's just really wonderful to hear about your work, to hear about the, and, and agree that there's so much more still to be done. There is space for a lot of new ideas, new work, new methodologies, um, so it's this topic and these issues are not going away anytime soon. Um, thank you both for being here and sharing this incredible work. Congratulations again on your awards. We're really excited to have both of those pieces out. And um, Yvette, do you want to say anything more in conclusion? Well, I just wanted to thank all of you, including you, Joan, and especially Heather and Rachel for opening the space for everybody and inviting everybody in the conversation. I really enjoyed, I think you just exemplified the synergies between your work so well, but I think you did it with these open edges, inviting everybody else into the conversation and the further research and work. So thanks for that and look forward to these conversations uh, in the future. And just a short plug for next week, we actually will be celebrating another award with another two great colleagues, uh, Leslie Bartlett and Amy Do um, Amy, Amy Jo Dowd, who will be, uh, who are the recipients of the last year's George Barrett Day Award for the best article in comparative ed review. So join us if you can for the conversation. I posted the link for the registration in the chat box as well. But huge thanks to everybody who joined us and for our um, presenters, conversationalists. Thank you everybody for coming. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm personally not good at monitoring chat and also like trying to put two words together. So I, I'm gonna save the chat. I hope that's okay. Okay, thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.